Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. God is good. God is good. And all the time. Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. And I frequently say, truth will endure to all generations. One day, error shall come to an end. Along with those who persist in living their lives by error. Let me say differently. As long as there was God there was truth. As long as there is God, tell me, there is truth. As long as there shall be God, there shall be truth. But error, false doctrine, false teaching will one day come to an end along with those who persist in living their lives by error. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Uh, I'm sure God was delighted to hear you say that. If you are breathing, you are blessed. Are you following me? Yes, I thank God for the high honor of being here to be with you for the next few days. I thank my good pastor for entrusting this sacred desk to me. I will honor God and honor him by giving to you, thus saith the Lord, can you say amen? And from time to time, I will spice it up from wisdom from the servant of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Do you know who the servant of the Lord is? Yeah. Give me the name of that person. Yes, largely forgotten among many of us, but not dead. Are you following me? Yeah. Wisdom never dies. Is there anyone present? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? Ah, God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? You are not a... Ah, God bless you. We have three. Anybody else? All right. My brother, my brother, my brother. And I'm sure there are those online who are guests. We're delighted to have you. Let me offer a prayer now for all our guests. Our Father in heaven, we have distinguished guests among us and online. We are delighted to have them. And I ask you now, Father, in the name of Jesus and with the agreement of every member, bless them. In all areas of their lives, bless them. If they have children, put a double blessing on their children, their God. And put the urge within them to come and fellowship with us again. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Thank you for coming. Remember, we'll be here all week. Our subject for this evening, keep, but don't touch. What did I say? Keep, but don't touch. Do three little favors for me. They're very, very simple. If you're not using one of these things as a Bible, which it is not, please turn them off. Not down, off completely. Because a vibration will disturb God. So turn them off completely. If you're not using them. I'm not opposed to your using them. But if you're not, turn them off so that nothing rings in the presence of a holy God. The same respect you would show if you went to the courtroom and sat in front of an earthly judge. 
Favor, and this is for the sake of reverence. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I surely, as God lives, I want to speak God's words. And if you offer that prayer from time to time, quietly in your heart, God will hear you. And the words I speak will be safe for your mind. Favor number three, think. Isaiah 1, 18, come now, let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord, which means the God we serve is a reasonable God. Because he tells us, come, let us reason together. The devil is not reasonable. God is reasonable. Let's bow our heads and pray. Loving Father in heaven, I come to you today, God, because you alone can help. And the help I need is your spirit, your wisdom, and the humility of Christ. If I've offended you today, God, forgive me. You are a God who loves to forgive. You hold no grudges. Cleanse me, dear God, that I might be an instrument in your hand that you can use. Put your words in my mouth, the humility of Christ in my heart. Give enlightenment and understanding to those listening in person and online. Post mighty angels around this church to keep at bay the forces of darkness. Put a double blessing on all our guests, dear God, wherever they may be, in this building or online. In the name of Jesus Christ, bless this country of the United States. Guide the thinking and the deliberations of the leaders, dear God. And in your own way, remind them that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men. Bless every other nation represented by those watching. Now, Father, take full control. Use me, God. Possess me, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen, amen and Amen. Revelation 21, we'll read verse 1. It is, I don't see a clock. 7.45, all right? I'll release you by 8.30, perhaps before. I know you've got to go to work tomorrow, so we'll try to be understanding. We must practice temperance even in preaching. What book did I say? What chapter? What verse? If you have my version, the King James Version, read with me. And I saw, what? A new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. We'll read that again this time microscopically and we'll ask some questions. And I saw what? A new heaven and a new earth. Why? For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Why? Why will it be necessary for God to make a new heaven and a new earth? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1, we'll read from verse 10. The words we read are the words of God the Father speaking to the Son. Very interesting chapter, Hebrews chapter 1. Very, very fascinating. The Father is speaking to the Son, and you and I can listen quietly. Hebrews 1, reading from verse 10. And this is God the Father speaking to Jesus Christ. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Next verse. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Now God the Father says, heaven and earth will perish. They shall perish, but thou remainest. That, by the way, is the statement of the eternal nature of Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth shall perish. But you shall remain, and they shall wax old as doth the garment. They shall wax old as doth the garment. God the Father tells us, as he speaks to Christ, heaven and earth are wearing away. Like an old shirt, old pair of socks. Why? 
Let's go to Genesis 1. We'll read verse 31. What's our subject? Keep it, but don't touch it. Keep, but don't touch. Genesis 1, let's read verse 31. No, we'll read 1 and then 31 of Genesis 1. When you found it, say amen. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God saw everything that he had made, heaven and earth. And behold, it was very good. Why is it necessary to remake something that God himself describes as very good? Let's go to chapter 2. We read from verse 16. Our subject, keep, but don't touch. Do you have chapter 2? From verse 16? Let me pray again. Father, continue to speak through me. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Look at verse 16 again. Let's read it one more time. And the Lord God suggested to the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. How does the verse read? Amen. And the Lord God commanded the man. So we come into contact with command. As early as Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, early I say, in the sense that the word is used, but there's command in Genesis way back in chapter 1. But we won't get into that now unless the Spirit moves me in this direction. God told Adam, if you eat of that tree, you'll die. Now the Bible says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. What have we said? One day, God will make a new and a new Yes, a new heaven, a new earth. Why? The first heaven and the first earth will pass away. Why? That's what we're about to find out. Why will the first heaven and the first earth pass away? God told Adam, do not eat of this tree. That was a command. But the Bible says, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So when God said, thou shalt surely die, God was telling Adam, if you disobey, what will you be doing? Give me one word, three letters. Sin. You see, when God said, thou shalt surely die, there's only one reason why people die. What's that reason? Sin. Remove sin and death cannot occur. Let me say it again. Differently. Death only exists because of sin. God told Adam, if you sin, you will die. Now we know from chapter 3 that Adam and Eve did partake of the fruit. They sinned and death came in. Not immediately, but the condemnation of death came. All right. Adam and Eve sinned. What did they do by sinning? They violated the law of God. They broke the commandment of God. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Let's read verse 4. I said, we keep, but don't touch. 1 John chapter 3, reading verse 4. It's a well-known verse. The Bible says, whosoever does what? Committed sin, come on, transgresseth also the law. Finish the verse. For sin is the transgression of the law. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. So Adam sinned because Adam did what? Transgress the law of God. Now, let's go to Genesis 3. We'll read from verse 17. Our subject, keep but don't touch. I hope you don't mind if I take you from verse to verse. That way you may be assured 
I am not speaking, but the words of God are speaking. Do you have Genesis 3? We read from verse 17. Adam and Eve have sinned. God has addressed the serpent in the 14 and 15. He's addressed the woman in 16. Now he addresses the man in verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. The earth was cursed because of sin. Anything cursed cannot last forever because the curse is destructive. Are you with me? Sin is destructive. The curse of sin is destructive. Something destructive brings itself and everything around it to an end eventually. Now it may take millennia, but it will happen. But when God made heaven and earth, it was not God's idea, his intention, his plan, his will, that his creation would come to an end. And so God had to do something. He had to remake, and one day he will, heaven and earth. Let's look at why it was such a crisis when Adam sinned. Why couldn't God have overlooked the sin, which is the transgression of the law? Go with me to Exodus 25. It would be good if you can write these references down. Refer to them when you get home again. What book did I say? Exodus, what chapter? 25, we'll read from verse 8. Another verse with which we're very familiar. This is, this is God speaking to Moses while the Israelites were in the wilderness. And let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. God tells Moses, make me a sanctuary. Why? That I might dwell among them. Which means there's something required in order for God to dwell among his people. Make me that sanctuary. Because I want to come close and dwell among them. Verse 10. And they shall make an ark of shit and wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Verse 11. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. God gives Moses instructions for the construction of the very first thing to be included in the tabernacle, the ark. Verse 17. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Of beaten gold shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. Now we have the box. We have a cover called the mercy seat. We have two cherubims, one on either side. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat, shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. Or look now, what is God saying? The cherubim on either side of the ark. Let's say this is the box. There's an angel called a cherub. An angel called a cherub, they are, their wings are overshadowing this box. They're looking down, but facing each other. Are you with me? Now, all of this is designed to teach the gospel. They are facing each other, but looking down. What are they looking at? Let's read verse 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark, thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. They are looking at what is the mercy seat and what's right under the mercy seat, which is the testimony. Give me another word for the testimony. The law. The law of God is referred to as the testimony. Since you have a puzzled look on your face, let the Bible clear it up for you. Let's go to Exodus 31. Let's read verse 18. Our subject, keep but don't touch. It's a five minutes to eight. 
When did I say I'll let you go? By 8.30. All right. <laughs> I'll try to keep my word. What book did I say? Exodus, what chapter? 31, what verse 18? If you have my version, read with me. And he gave unto Moses. When he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of what? Testimony. Keep reading. Tables of stone written with the finger of God. So the testimony is just a reference to the Ten Commandments. If that's clear, say amen. Now we go back to chapter 25 and we'll read verse 21. Moses, you make the box, put the cover, which is called the mercy seat, an angel on either side. Now, in that box, verse 21, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee now. Read verse 22. It is a very, very, very significant verse. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee, from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now God is saying, everything I say comes from here. What did I say is on either side of the box? What's the name of that angel? A cherub, yes. The plural cherubim, now the Bible says cherubims, but cherubim is plural. One on one side, one on the other, in between the ark. Now, God's presence was right between the two angels and just above the ark. The Bible will tell us that. Go to Psalm 99. Psalm 99. We're trying to understand why was this such a crisis when Adam broke the law. Psalm 99. We'll read verse 1. Are you there? Amen. Read with me. What does that say? The Lord reigneth. Let the people what? Tremble. Read the next statement for me. He sitteth where? Between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. The, the, the Israelites referred to God as the one that sat between the cherubim. Meaning that box functioned as the place where God sat. Now, is God king? Yes or no? Yes. What does a king sit on? That box symbolized the throne of God. Let me give you another text. Go to Isaiah 37. Isaiah 37. Let's read verse 16. Isaiah 37, reading verse 16, our subject, keep but don't touch. Read with me. What does that say? O oh Lord of hosts, God of Israel, keep reading now, that dwellest where? Between the cherubims. The Israelites understood symbolically this was where God sat. A king sits on a throne. Now, hundreds of years later, Ezekiel has a vision. Go to Ezekiel 1. Remember the wheel in the middle of a wheel? Remember that? Let's go to Ezekiel 1. We'll read verse 26. Ezekiel 1, verse 26. Keep, but don't touch. And above the firmament that was over the heads was the likeness of what? A throne. Keep reading. As the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man upon it. Ezekiel sees a throne. How is the throne described? A sapphire stone. That's the way it looked to him. Let's go to Exodus 24. Hundreds of years earlier, in the wilderness, Mount Sinai, Exodus 24, let's read verse 10. Do you have that? And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work, keep reading, of a sapphire stone. So when most now in verse 9, the Bible says, Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. What they saw was as if God was standing and the foundation on which he stood was a sapphire stone. In Exodus, we have God standing 
on a sapphire stone. In Ezekiel, we have him sitting on a sapphire throne. Sapphire is blue. Are you with me? All right. Now, you may say, what's the big thing? Go to Numbers 15. Numbers 15. Our subject, keep but don't touch. It's now two minutes after eight. What's funny? I just want you to know I'm aware of time, and I will release you. I know you're all professional people, and you're all time conscious. What book did I say? What chapter? 15. What verse? 32. When you found it, say amen. And while the Israelites were in the wilderness, they did what? They found a man that did what? Gathering stakes upon the Sabbath, mm -hmm. which he should not have been doing. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. 35. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout the generation, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. Now, what did the man do that led to his death? He sinned. That's the only thing that causes death. He sinned. The particular sin was he, he violated the Sabbath commandment. Now, God is so merciful, he does not want to kill anybody else. Now, God takes what's his. That's life. Are you with me? God is not a murderer. God does not break commandment six, thou shalt not kill. God just takes back what's his. We are murderers, not God. Somebody say amen for God. All right. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them through borders, fringes in the borders of the garments throughout the generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. Verse 39. And it shall be unto you for what? For a fringe, that ye may do what? Look upon it and remember what? All the commandments of the Lord and do them and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which ye used to go a whoring. In other words, stop doing whatever you want to do and obey me. You see, there are two options. Do whatever you want or do what God wants. It is not do what the beast says. It's really do what you want. And what God wants. Are you following me? Because you have to choose to follow the beast. The choice is yours. It is either do what God says and God said, obey me and stop following your own heart and your own eyes. I just feel that the Sabbath is Wednesday. I think that I ought to marry two women. I, I, I really feel I should eat pork. It's not how you feel or what you think. But thus saith the Lord, and God said, Obey me. Don't follow your eyes on your heart. Because the heart is deceitful. Come on. Above all things, who can know it? And so God tells them, Put a ribbon of blue so that you remember what? My commandments. Let's reason together. The color blue in the Bible symbolizes law. Obedience, loyalty to God. Now, what was the color of the throne on which they saw God sitting in Ezekiel, which is what? Blue. What was the color of the foundation on which Moses and the others saw God standing? Blue. Now, what was in the ark? What color symbolizes the law? What does God sit on? His throne is based on what? Law. You're right. Law. God's throne is based on law. So that when I sin, I attack the very throne 
of God's universal kingdom. In the United States, anything contrary to the Constitution is to be thrown out in court. Are you with me? When a president takes an oath, he takes an oath to defend the Constitution, not defend you. Defend the Constitution against what enemies? All foreign, come on, and domestic. Do not touch that Constitution. Keep it, but don't touch it. God has a government. His government has a constitution. The constitution is the law of God. When Adam sinned, Adam threatened the universal kingdom of God. God cannot minimize that. But before Adam sinned, someone else had sinned. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. Satan threatened the very kingdom of God by violating God's law in the way he did it. And God had to get rid of him. My brothers and sisters, sin isn't simply a bad choice. Sin isn't simply an act of indiscretion. Sin is a direct attack upon God. Go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Keep, but don't touch it. Psalm 51. Read verse 5 for me. What is that? This is David confessing his sin of adultery and murder. What does he say in verse 5 of Psalm 51? And the sin did my mother conceive me. Now, okay. David is saying, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I am a sinner. I have lived in violation to some degree of God's law. He also says, against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that I might be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest three and four. David said, I sinned against you. He did not mention Uriah. The woman's husband. Even though at a lower level he sinned against him. David sinned against God. When Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife, remember that story, Genesis 39? Joseph said to her, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God, not Potiphar? All sin is first and foremost a direct and personal offense against God. Now understand clearly, sin is the exact opposite of all that God is, which is righteousness. That's why God can say of Jesus in Hebrews 1 verse 9, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. God hates sin. Because sin is a threat to his government. As a matter of fact, hold on to your seats. The ultimate purpose of sin, the ultimate aim of sin is the destruction of God. If you don't believe that, cast your mind to Calvary. The ultimate aim of sin is the destruction of God. Listen to Jesus. Ye are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. A murderer of whom? Whom did he try to murder? Jesus, the creator, one equal with the father. He was a murderer from the beginning. Let me say it again. The ultimate aim of sin is the death of God. It begins by killing him in our lives. Get rid of him. Let some other power direct our lives. The ultimate aim of sin is the death of God. My brothers and sisters, the entire universal kingdom of God is run by law. It is based on law. This is not legalistic teaching. This is biblical reality. Remove the law and the government of God would collapse. Which is what Satan wants because Satan is a master of anarchy and chaos. God is a God of order, not of confusion. Remove God's law 
and his universal kingdom would collapse. And so when Adam sinned, God could not change his law. He could not lower his law. He had to send someone to die to pay the penalty and that someone had to be equal with God himself. This is another testament to the sacredness of God's law. The only person who could atone for this law is someone equal with God the Father. If you get a ticket, you can go to the police station and have somebody pay it for you. Are you following me? And they'll gladly take your money. No one else could have paid a penalty for sin than Jesus Christ, who is fully God. He is called in Isaiah 9, 6, the mighty God. The Father himself calls him God in Hebrews 1, verse 8. The fact that someone equal with God had to die tells you the status that the law occupies in the eyes of God. I'll tell you something else we just discovered. When Adam sinned, he violated the law of God. Now, we read earlier that there will be a new heaven and a new earth, which means there'll be new people. You didn't hear me. There will be new people. Go to Ecclesiastes 12. Let's read 13. Keep, but don't touch. Ecclesiastes 12, reading from verse 13. You have that? Not yet. Nobody answered the guest preacher. You have it now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me pray again. Fathers, I continue to speak for you and to your blessed people. Instruct me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Now Solomon had left God for a while. He went off, whatever he did, came back in his later years. Now he looks back over his life from a man whom God had given more wisdom than anybody else and more wealth to someone who led the entire nation into idolatry, married 700 wives, 300 concubines, built temples for false gods. How Solomon could do that is beyond me with all that wisdom. He looks back over his life and he tells you and me, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What is life all about? Fear God, recognize who he is, and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, read the next verse. For God, what? Shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Solomon is saying, in the judgment, the standard is God's law. Not how many offices you've held in the church, but don't give up the ones you have. The standard is God's law. Let's go to James chapter 2. James 2. Now James is the brother or was the brother of Jesus. So let's listen to one of Christ's brothers. Christ had two brothers who wrote books of the Bible. One was James. Who was the other? Jude. He has the book just before Revelation. Uh, James 2, let's read verse 12. Listen to the brother of Christ as he speaks to you. Are you there? Amen. Read with me. What does that say? So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be what? Judged by the law of? Now, the law of liberty refers to the Ten Commandments. How do I know that? Let's go to verse 8. If he fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and offend in one point, he's guilty of all. Now, 11. For he that said what? Do not commit adultery, said also what? Do not kill. Where is James quoting from? The Ten Commandments. And he called the Ten Commandments in verse 12, the law of liberty. He said, so speak ye and so do. Live as if you understand that one day you'll be judged by the law of God. He also calls it the royal law in that book. Why is the law so significant? It is the foundation of God's throne. Why is the law so significant? Without the law, nothing can exist. 
Let me say it again. Without law, nothing can exist, animate or inanimate. Mm. Inanimate things are under the laws of physics. Am I right? Oh, yes. Animate things are under the law of physics. If those laws vanish, these things cease to exist. Let me tell you again, there is no existence without law. But the devil's business is death. And so he leads you and me into sin, into lawlessness. Ultimately, the end of that person is death. The end of that person is death. Satan's merchandise is death. Jesus said of him, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life. What is that life? Simple obedience to God. We would have had that life today had Adam simply obeyed God. Let me give you a couple of quotations. This is a revival week, am I right? Yes. <clears throat> you may write this down. The Great Controversy, page 478, paragraph 3. What did I say? 478, paragraph 3. God bless you for trying. Listen carefully. It is only as the law of God is restored to its rightful position that there can be a revival of primitive faith and godliness among his professed people. It is only because the law is an expression of righteousness, it is an expression of holiness. There is no holiness without obedience. Because unholiness is sin. And sin is a violation of the law. Turn that around. Holiness is conformity with God's law. Simple. It is only as the law of God is restored to its rightful position. Now what is the rightful position of the law? When God told Moses build a sanctuary with all its parts and compartments, the first thing made was that ark about which we spoke in Exodus 25. That ark was the heart of the sanctuary because it contained the law. This must be God's holy place on earth. You're not listening. This church isn't God's holy place. It's a holy building, yes. This is what God wants to make his holy place. Now, what was the only article of furniture in the holy place? The ark that contained what? The law. And so God says under the new covenant, I will write my law where? In their hearts. Wherever the law is, this must be God's holy place. I'm talking to myself. Nobody's listening. You're nice looking, but you're not listening. I will write my law where? Here. Where was the law on earth? In the holy, most holy place. Whereas wherever the law is, that's the most holy place. God wants that law right here. Are you following me? Now, if the law is here, what has to go? Blessings upon you. Because righteousness and sin cannot occupy the same space. Let the Bible explain that. Go to Malachi chapter 2. It's 23 after 8. What book did I say? Malachi. Tell me something about Malachi. The yes. The most obvious item of information about Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Okay. Malachi 2. Let's read verse 6. Do you have Malachi? Very fascinating book, by the way. Read the whole book sometime. It doesn't take long. Speaking about the Levites, read verse 6, the law of truth was where? In his mouth. Read the next statement, iniquity was not found where? In his lips. Now, you look at that carefully. Lips and mouth are the same thing in that verse. Are you following me? Lips, this is a poetry, it's a poetic expression. Lips and mouth are the same thing. The law of truth was in his mouth. Because of that, read the next statement. Iniquity was not found in his lips or in his mouth. Where the law is, finish my words, sin cannot be. 
you cannot obey God and sin at the same time. You didn't hear me again. Let me say it differently. You cannot have faith and sin at the same time. You've got to let go faith for a while, then sin, then come back to faith. You cannot express faith and sin at the same time. You cannot genuinely pray and sin at the same time. The law of truth was in his mouth. Because of that, iniquity was not found in his lips. My brothers and sisters, God gave Moses microscopic instructions for the construction of the tabernacle and the heart and soul of the tabernacle was the ark which contained the Ten Commandments. That box only had meaning because it contained the law. That's, that's the reason why it was holy. When Uzzah touched that ark, 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 7, 6 and 7, God killed him because he put his hand on the Ten Commandments. Let me say it again. There was a man called Uzza. The ark was being moved from one place to the next. The ox cart stumbled. Uzza reached out to settle and he touched the ark. And God had given instructions, no one is to touch this ark. But why was the ark so special? Great Controversy, page 433, paragraph 2. What did I say? The ark was merely a receptacle. What is a receptacle? A container for the tables of the law and the presence of these divine precepts gave to it its value and sacredness. Now think with me. When the Israelites moved, what went ahead of them? The ark. Give me another word. What went ahead of them? The law. <laughs> the law went ahead of them. Because this is the life God requires. And this law expresses the righteousness of God. When they moved, the law went ahead of them. When the Israelites captured the ark and put it in their temples, what happened to their gods? What happened to the Philistine gods when they put the ark in a Philistine temple? They fell. Because the law of God has power to conquer the enemy. Ah, you didn't hear me. The law of God has power to conquer evil. And so when God's law was put in that temple, the false gods fell. And if you, by the Spirit of God, will allow God to erect his law in here, the false gods you may have had in your life will fall. Because there is no power like spirit-based power, obedience. And so our subject, keep, but don't touch it. Don't touch that law. Keep it. Also touched it, died. When we sin, that's how we put our hands on God's law. And the penalty is still the same death unless there's repentance. My brothers and sisters, do you realize even the angels obey the law of God? Go to Psalm 103. Let's read verse 20. Our subject, keep but don't touch. And I'm coming to a close. I thought you'd say amen. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll go to 930 if you don't. All right. What book did I say? Psalm. What Psalm? 103. What verse? 20. Let me pray again. Father, I'm sliding to the end. Be with me, God. Don't cut off your help, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Read with me verse 20 of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength. Read carefully now that. Do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. They do his commandments. Not the commandments of Constantine. Not the commandments of the papacy. Not the commandments of the United States that allows a man to marry a man. The commandments of God. Jesus told Satan, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of 
God. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4A, page 150, paragraph 1, Ellen White writes, Christ refers to his Father's law. When he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, every word meant every commandment. Christ refers to his Father's law. The words spoken on Sinai are the conditions of life. The Bible tells us other places, Romans 7 verse 10, and the commandment that was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. It is only death when you and I disobey. It, the, God's law is life. Keep, but don't touch it. How do we touch God's law? Give me that long word, starts with an O, a D. Disobedience. Take your hand, and I'll take my off God's law. Keep it. Don't touch it. Because when you touch it, you're putting your hand on God himself. When, if, when the queen was alive, it also applies to King Charles. You can't touch the queen. You can speak to her first. Protocol, she has to speak first. She has to extend her hand. You can't, what's happening, queen? You can't do that. Are you following me? Now, we come to God. What's happening, God? You can't do that. God is holy. Holy. Loves you, but holy. So the angels keep it. Don't touch it. How many of you will say with me, Father, help me to keep your law and not touch it by disobedience. Can I see your hand? Help me to keep, stand up with me. Listen to me carefully. There's someone listening to me who's probably saying, I'd like to obey God, but there's a commandment I cannot keep. Maybe the fourth, remember the Sabbath day. Listen to what God tells you. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, let's make it more particular. I can... Make it more particular. I can. I can. I can keep. Be more specific. I can keep. I can keep the Sabbath. Finish it now. Through Christ, which strengthens me. I'll tell you something else about this the law. The commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5, verse 3. It is not hard to obey God if you give him this. You see, this is hard. Not this. The reason why we find God's law difficult, this is still made of stone. When we give this to God, then God can say of us, as the Bible says of Christ, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And when it's in the heart, we do it gladly. We do it joyfully. We are indeed citizens of God's kingdom, of which the constitution is the law of God. Let's keep it. But don't touch it. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven... We thank you for your word. We thank you for your law. It's a law of life. It gives order. It gives meaning. It gives direction. It expresses the very righteousness of you, dear Father, and of Jesus. Dear God, if we have lived in violation of your law, forgive us. It is your will, your desire that we obey you. If Adam had obeyed, we would not be in this condition. In the name of Jesus Christ, their God, who died because the law was broken. Come into our hearts, Father. Change our appetites. Change the way we think. Give us a mind that loves your law. So that we might say with the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Change us, dear God. Make us law-abiding citizens of your kingdom, 
Save us when you come and put us in that new world where there will be no sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say amen, amen and amen. Come back tomorrow. Bring someone with you.